Nauvoo the Beautiful, the frontier settlement was called, and for one brief shining moment, no more than a few years really, it was the embodiment of happiness. In the 1840s, Nauvoo was home to thousands who hailed from England, Canada, and the eastern shores of America. With the fire of Israel's God burning in their hearts, these converts gathered to that bend on the Mississippi at the call of the prophet Joseph Smith. They went to work, shoulder to shoulder, building a city that soon rivaled Chicago as the largest in Illinois. They built homes, farms, businesses, and a temple. In a few short months, forced to abandon their homes, the settlers of Nauvoo would cross the great Mississippi River, seeking a new home in the American West.
we tried with every effort to maintain the integrity of the original thoughts of the prophet Joseph Smith and, and those who helped, including the architect William Weeks. Um, we were lucky enough to have the drawings from the uh, original architect that were discovered back in the 1940s by some missionaries in California through the descendant of the architect. And from those drawings, we gleaned most of the information we had. We were also very fortunate to have um, photographs, which were at that time known as daguerreotypes, and uh, most of which were pretty fuzzy and very difficult to discern. But believe it or not, it was the, the image of the temple that we were concerned about because the drawings invariably discussed and determined what the architect had envisioned. But never usually ends up that way in the final project. Because of his drawings, we knew quite a bit about the font and how it was developed. Uh, the oval shape, the size, it's larger than what we've been doing recently in modern times. It's a large font. We knew about the oxen. We knew how they were developed. We had details of the stairs of uh, entry into the font and exiting. So that room, we feel, confident uh, of how it was developed and of course there was a spring or a well there that was their water source in those uh, early pioneer days and we found that uh, spring as we were excavating and and mucked it out and capped it and uh, so we we felt we were pretty accurate in the font level the lower basement level the other levels uh, the assembly room we had some writings about what it was and we had some of the woodwork details, but not a lot. So we patterned the assembly room, the main floor, a lot like Kirtland, thinking that if they'd had the time, they would have finished it similar to Kirtland because it was assembly room. They used it for talks and, and, and uh, the teachings of the Prophet Joseph and Brigham. And they also used it at a, times as a dance hall and an assembly room for the community until it was dedicated and that stopped. The upper levels were pretty much temporary, temporary walls. Uh, there were offices up on the attic level, but uh, most of that information came from journals and things that we found in the writings. For example, one journal indicated on the upper level they could see the light coming through the skylights. We didn't know much about the skylights, and so that helped us to develop those concepts.
Sacrifice. It's one of the strengths that built this mighty land. Put simply, it's a willingness to give up something needed or treasured for a greater good. And the measure of the willingness to sacrifice is one measure of a people. Pilgrims sacrificed their homelands for God. Settlers by the shipload followed their lead. Then these hardy folk moved across America, shaping a nation. Sacrifice was abundant in Nauvoo, Illinois in the 19th century. The people of Nauvoo were essentially religious refugees with a fervent desire to build a temple for God. The massive undertaking required expertise they didn't have and funds they couldn't muster. So they gave what they did have, time, a willingness to work hard, and a spirit that said, share first and worry about yourself later. One woman recorded in her journal, the people were most of them poor and they denied themselves every comfort they possibly could to assist in finishing the temple. Men donated one day in 10 and few who worked full time received pay. Most survived on meager mains, wrote one man. Many times I have worked on the stone quarry on the banks of the Mississippi River and had nothing for dinner but cornbread when dry dipped in the river. People did whatever they could. A donation record from November 16, 1842 showed $20 in cash, 13 and a half yarns of cloth, a skein of yarn, a quilt, three animal skins, two pair of boots and a pair of shoes, some socks and mittens, and 25 pounds of apples. Women sewed shirts for the workers, portioned out their garden produce, and contributed pennies, one at a time eventually collecting $1,000 to purchase the glass and nails for their temple. All this came from a group sharing their food to stay alive. Today, a temple stands again in Nauvoo, rebuilt by a generation who hasn't forgotten the sacrifices of its predecessors. This landmark temple serves as a symbol of the determination, resilience, and courage of the original builders and also as an inspiration today for countless Americans who, like their ancestors, have the heart and soul of a people willing to give their all for what they believe.
the blending of the two craftsmanship and technology is always very difficult. I, I think we, we did it successfully. We couldn't turn our backs on technology because we could build a better building. And I think the church is interested in maintaining a structure for a long time. And uh, we built a structure that will be maintained for a long time. But at the same time, we wanted to capture the same spirit and, and beauty that the uh, old craftsmen were able to do, one of which was the talents that uh, Charles Allen was able to give to the project. I think of all the other disciplines on the project, his was probably the most true to his craft. He did pretty much everything as they would have done, with the exception of probably adding the thermal window. The stone carving was done with chisels, probably the same ones they had, but it was aided by compressed air hammers. <laughs> so they had the benefit of using some technology, but uh, it still was done by the hand. And uh, the carvers that carved uh, the, the oxen, the sunstone, the, the moonstones, those things, they, some used very old techniques and used it utilizing the mold to the working piece. It was centuries old technology, but they used a air hammer. So, I mean, some things you can never give up on, but other things I think improved and helped their work as well. So there was a nice blending of the two. My great-great-grandfather worked on the original temple. And when I thought that he might be watching what we do, I thought how amazed he would be at our modern equipment. Uh, cranes that could lift large pieces of steel, uh, concrete pumps that could pump to the fifth floor and place concrete with a minimum of uh, back-breaking labor compared to the way, the methods that he had to use. We were in a quandary as to how the markings, which were made by tooling on the limestone, were made. We studied old photographs, old plans, uh, old stones that had been found. But uh, all those sources left some doubt in our minds as to what exactly the finish would be on the limestone. Well, right while we were worrying about this matter, the uh, excavator had to make an excavation for something or other, and he was using his backhoe, and suddenly he struck a, a solid, a very solid object. So we carefully dug it up, and we found three pieces of limestone from the original temple that had all the marks on it that we needed to plan for the marks on the new stones. Uh, I cannot help but think that the Lord knew where to have this man dig to encounter these old pieces of stone from the old temple. And it's my belief the Lord guided us to find them.
information that I had available as to how to make these windows the way they would have been basically came from the, uh, some sketches that the uh, original architect, William Weeks, had, and uh, also from the daguerreotype that was uh, taken of the temple, the uh, south side. And uh, that was blown up into a larger um, area, and I could see the details of the windows. And in other words, the tall arc top windows were actually three sash in that window. And I'd assumed that they were, but until I saw that uh, the blow up or the, the, the enlargement of some of that, uh, you know, we were, we were able to know how that they were, they were made then. And also the star pattern in the little round windows uh, in the upper part of the temple, the, uh, the star pattern showed up in that daguerreotype too when it was cleaned up and expanded. But uh, basically it was, the, it was the picture and sketches and then the experience that I had, have had over the years in knowing, in knowing how to fabricate uh, windows of antiquity. When I built the, uh, the first sample of the star window, um, I didn't have the glass in it, it was just a window sash, the frame, and I set it up on my uh, table and, and uh, stood back and took a look at it and tried to visualize in my mind how the you know, red, white, and blue glass would, would be positioned and the architects had suggested uh, a certain way in the specifications. And as I visualized that, uh, it, it didn't seem comfortable to me. And so I went to my drafting table and drew up the, the picture of the star window and took colored pencils. And I drew uh, uh, and colored uh, what I felt comfortable with. And uh, a couple of days later, the architect was in town and I was able to uh, express my feelings to him that uh, the colored glass needed to be uh, perhaps changed in their positioning. In other words, they had suggested that the field be white, the points of the star be blue, and the center red. And uh, what I felt more comfortable with was uh, the, the field to be blue with the white points and the red center, uh, because I felt that it was a nighttime scene, so the, the blue needed to be in the background. And when I suggested this to them, that it was nighttime scene, and asked them what they felt that the uh, the uh, background color should be, they immediately realized it should be, should be blue. And uh, so those were the things I felt very comfortable with that afterwards. Things like that happened uh, in, in the project uh, where I had to make some minor adjustments to feel comfortable and then when I felt comfortable we moved on. And I know that uh, all of our experiences and all of our efforts were beyond our normal and natural capabilities. That I know. And that it, uh, it uh, feels good to have uh, accomplished the work. When I look at the temple now, I can't look at it very long because I get a little emotional because to me it's still a miracle that those windows came from our small shop just a couple blocks away.
The Nauvoo Temple is extremely unique from the standpoint that it not only is a functioning temple, but it's a, a monument, if you will, to the saints not only who built the original temple, but who have made this uh, church great and have dedicated their life to the Savior. This temple has a spirit that is unlike any other temple. Every temple has a spirit. This particular temple has a unique spirit, and it's a combination not only of the spirit vested by the Lord and our Savior, but by all those who dedicated their lives before, all of the, uh, the prophets, uh, Joseph and uh, Brigham and uh, even Wilfred Woodruff and John Taylor, who uh, later were prophets, the spirit of those who worked on that temple originally, the spirit of those who worked on the temple today, and all of the people in the church who have had that temple influence their lives. So this temple has a spirit that is um, a combination of all those elements, and it's a unique spirit. It's a, a, a wonderful spirit.
You know, President Hinckley says a temple, until it's dedicated and used for the purposes for which it's uh, meant to be used for, is just another beautiful building until that takes place. However, during the construction process, uh, because of the way the temple was set up, we had very strict rules against, uh, all, everyone had to have a drug test that, to work on the temple, and they took random tests. We didn't allow any profanity, and uh, we uh, allowed no smoking on the site. And this, uh, this affected the, uh, the contractors for the good. And it was a, a, a good thing because, you know, really, the whole church is built around people. The beautiful buildings for, for the salvation of people, us, as members and non-members of the church. And through that process, <clears throat> we saw people who changed their lives uh, for the better, I remember walking out of the office one day and a young man, I would guess he was about 19 or 20, was headed for the construction traders. And he, uh, I said, uh, where are you going? He says, I'm going home. I says, home? We're not through yet. He says, I know. He says, I, uh, but I've got to go home. He says, I've got to go home and see my bishop and get my life in order so I can go through the temple. And uh, that was just one case of many where lives on, that, on the temple were changed.
But as I look back upon it, it is, uh, it's almost like a dream. It was the greatest experience of my life and my wife's life. It was an absolutely wonderful project. One of the happiest moments of my life was serving there and working on it. It's something to treasure, something to cherish. It's, it's something that uh, we talk about a great deal in our home because of the spirit that it's brought there, because of the wonderful experiences my family has had. It just uh, gives you a feeling that you can't have anywhere else to know that you're standing on that same ground where Joseph Smith, John Taylor, Brigham Young, Wilford Woodruff, and all the others stood. And that doesn't leave your mind. And we were blessed on that temple. We were really blessed to overcome challenges and to have the beautiful building that's there today. And it's a, it is a monument to the former saints, no question about it. It is a great consecrated effort, and it's a temple not only a tribute to the pioneers and Joseph, but it is, I think, a tribute also to President Hinckley and his great leadership and a tribute to modern-day saints who did give and uh, did provide um, money and talents, time, energy, and, of course, their faith and love for the gospel. Oh. 